In the previous video, we saw that shells are broken up into subshells, right? We said that the first shell has an S subshell, and that's it. So these are our subshells. We said the second shell has an S and a P. The third shell has an S, a P, and a D. The fourth shell has an S, a P, a D, and an F. And the capacity of each of these S subshells is two. The capacity of each P subshell is six. The capacity of each D subshell is 10. And the capacity of each F subshell is 14. Okay, so in this video, I'm gonna introduce you to a new idea and that's orbitals. So electrons are grouped into shells they're grouped into subshells, but they're also grouped into orbitals, okay? And the huge rule of thumb for every single orbital is each orbital can only hold two electrons. Orbitals can never ever hold more than two electrons, okay? So from this, we can figure out how many orbitals each subshell has. So if the capacity of the S subshell is two electrons, this means there must just be one orbital in the S subshell. So we have one S orbital, okay? But the P subshell has a capacity of six electrons. So if each orbital in a P subshell can only hold two electrons, this must mean that we have three different P orbitals. The D subshell has a capacity of 10, so this means we must have five different D orbitals. And our F subshell has a capacity of 14, meaning we must have seven different F orbitals. Okay, so there are, there's only one S orbital, but we have three distinct P orbitals and five distinct D orbitals and seven distinct f orbitals, okay? Each of these orbitals in the p subshell are still part of that p subshell, but the electrons are positioned in different orbitals, okay? So let's think about orbitals a little bit more so you can get a better grasp of exactly what they are. All right, so an s orbital. s orbitals simply have the shapes of spheres. Okay, so that's an easy one to remember. So S is a sphere, okay? So the nucleus would be positioned directly in the middle of our sphere. So there's the nucleus right there, okay? But what's important to know about these orbitals is that these are not like um, the Bohr model of the atom. So the electron in an S orbital is not restricted to just being at this position or at this position. It's not orbiting. The electron is actually distributed equally throughout this entire orbital, okay? So this entire region is where electrons are in an S orbital. And that's really hard to uh, put, your, put your mind around. But just think about it this way. The electron can be anywhere in this shape and it moves so quickly that we can't see exactly where it is, but we can only see its average. So on average, an electron in an S orbital is positioned within this sphere somewhere, okay? And an S orbital in the first shell is nice and close to the nucleus. An S orbital in a higher shell, like the second shell, is a sphere that's on average a little bit further away from the nucleus. In the third shell, that S orbital is even more far away from the nucleus, okay? So electrons can be positioned anywhere in that sphere, but on average, as you move from shell one to shell two to shell three, on average, that electron is further away. So on average, it has a higher energy as you move away from the nucleus, okay? So that's an S orbital. P orbitals all have identical shapes, okay? The only difference is how they're positioned. So if this is our nucleus, then the shape of the P orbital looks like a dumbbell around it. 
Okay, so it has two different lobes. One lobe is on one side of the nucleus and one lobe is on the other side. So the electron or electrons are equally distributed throughout this entire shape. Okay, so we have three different p orbitals that all look like this. Okay, the only difference is how they're positioned in space. So one of these p orbitals is positioned along the y axis. If this is my y axis, then this would be called the p y orbital. Okay, we'll have another one, right? If this is the nucleus here, that's positioned that looks the same, right? It's the same dumbbell shape but this time it's positioned along the x-axis. So if this is our x-axis, then this would be our px orbital. And our third one, it looks the same, but it would be positioned along the z orbital. So let's try to, try to show it in three dimensions here. So if this is our nucleus, then the other orbital would be positioned along the z-axis. Okay, so let's see. We have our x-axis, we have our y-axis, and then the z-axis would be right going through it. So this would be our z-axis. So imagine this shape, this, this, this orbital, coming straight out of the plane of your computer. Right? So it's coming at you and going away from you. This is the pz orbital. The important thing to remember is that these three orbitals have identical shapes. They all look exactly the same. It's just they're positioned in space differently. Okay, um, The d orbitals are where things start to get a, a little bit more complicated and we're not really going to go into uh, exactly what all of them look like, but I do want you to have like a general idea of what they look like. Okay, So the d orbitals actually have four lobes. They're, they take on this like cloverleaf shape. Okay, one of them exists right on the x y axis. So, if this is our x y axis here, this would be the d x squared minus y squared. I'll say that the names of these, this x squared minus y squared, it's not important for you to remember. I just want you to have a really good understanding of what these orbitals look like. Okay. There are three other d orbitals that have the same shape, but they actually lie between the axes. Okay, so we have our cloverleaf shape, but they lie in, in between the axes. So if this is the x and y axis, then this orbital would be called the dxy. The lobes here are positioned between the x and the y coordinates. Okay, there are two others that look exactly like this, but the only difference is which, uh, which coordinates they, uh, they, they lie between. So let's say this is z and this is x. So one of them lies between the x and the z coordinate, so we would call this the dxz. Okay, there's also a dyz, which I won't bother drawing. Okay, it looks the same, it's just positioned between the y and the z axis. Finally, the last one, and this one's actually the coolest. So the last one here is called the dz squared. Okay, so the dz squared, if this is our nucleus right here, the dz squared orbital has what looks like a p orbital going along the z axis but it has this really cool ring of electron density going around it as well. So you have this ring going around it in, uh, in all directions, as well as this space above and this space below. So this one's called the dz squared. Okay, um, We're not even going to bother looking at the f orbitals because they're impossible to draw in two dimensions. But I do want you to have a good understanding of what these things look like because in the next video, we're going to take these ideas of what they look like and try to understand how these shapes influence the, um, the, the potential energy that an electron experiences when it's positioned in an s orbital versus a p orbital versus a d orbital.